It's great to welcome to the program today Mike Gravel, who is a former U.S. Senator serving from 1969 to 1981. He's not only a former presidential candidate, but is now a 2020 Democratic presidential contender. Uh, Senator Gravel, really a pleasure having you on. Um, let's just jump into it. Why, uh, why are you running? Why have you added your name to the long list of candidates running? Well, I added it because uh, the, the young man, 17 years old, uh, and his partner, Henry Williams, it was David Oaks, who contacted me and asked me if I would run for president. And I said, do you have any idea how old I am? <laughs> and he said, well, that doesn't ma matter. What counts is your position on uh, the issues. And uh, they had shown me the research that they did on my background and also on Tulsi Gabbard. And uh, they just felt that uh, that the issues that I had to present should be presented to the American public in the course of the presidential election. And the way to do that, of course, is to be able to get an, in the debates. And so they took on the task uh, of trying to get 65,000 uh, donors uh, they've got presently around uh, a, thir a third or almost uh, pushing towards a half of the donors. And they've got over sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 that they've raised. Uh, and they came out to visit me uh, about a month ago. Uh, David couldn't come because he, he got hospitalized just before his flight. Uh, but uh, it, it, gentleman by the name of Church, and also uh, Henry Williams came out, and we did, did uh, some videotaping and went over with David uh, the platform that we're ascribing to, and so that's what's got us into this situation. I, I've turned over the Twitter account that I never used from the 08 uh, campaign, uh, and they've been handling it uh, very diligently. And so uh, I'm not doing any work. It was part of the plan that I wouldn't have to do any work other than be interviewed by people like you, David. So, okay, let, let's start getting into some of this stuff because, the, as you mentioned, you've turned over control of the Twitter account uh, to, to these young guys. Is, is it true what I'm reading that sometimes they post stuff under your name that you don't even really agree with? Uh, I don't know about what I agree with. Uh, we went over great detail. They always ask me before they post something if I agree with this. And I be, I've, I've told, told them generally I agree. Now, there may be something I, I did caution them about being negative on other candidates uh, because I don't think that's productive because we're, we're an issue uh, situation. And uh, I wouldn't, I don't know of any issues that they put up uh, that I would disagree with. Uh, and, and so would, <laughs> if somebody does see something that they think that it's uncharacteristic of my past, then they could just let me know and I would discuss it with the, what I call our, the gravelistas, the kids. And, uh, who are managing the campaign. I, I'm not managing the campaign. I, I, I make myself available for interviews like this, but that's the extent of it. Okay, so he, here's one thing that I sort of want to get directly into, which is since you were a senator between 69 and 81 and 2016, right, so pre-Trump, the dynamics and the sort of tenor and tone in the Senate and in American politics changed significantly because that's a long period of time. And of course, since the election of Donald Trump, with the advent of so much policy being communicated on Twitter by the president and the sort of language and vocabulary and style that is now being adopted by more and more members of the House and Senate, how different is it really from what you see now compared to the way it was when you were in the Senate uh, in terms of the way politics is done? Or is it superficially different, but still basically working the same way in your estimation? No, it's, it's not acting the same way. Uh, <clears throat> the Republican Party uh, back then had credibility. You may not have agreed with them, but they, they essentially were 
crazy. They were reasonable people that had uh, conservative views. What you have today with the Trumpian, uh, not the Republican Party, but it's the Trumpian Party, because the Republicans have lined up to a man, except probably for Lisa Murkowski and, uh, uh, and, and the senator from Maine. Susan Collins. Uh, but the rest of them, it, it's just, it's an abomination. And it, can you get, uh, am, am I still being uh, recorded or what? You're with us. You're with us, Senator. Okay. The, the, the sort of situation today is, is much worse uh, because of the Republican Party, which has turned around and totally capitulated itself to the, the will of uh, Donald Trump, who essentially is a narcissistic fool. But, and so if, if he is that, and he's proven himself to be that, then the Republican Party to a man or a woman is, is, is behind him totally. Uh, and uh, so that, that leaves the situation, which I think is very unusual, and that is that if Trump loses the election, which I dearly hope he will, uh, he will drag down the Republican Party with him. And so this could be a, a, a really a, a, an earth moving situation in 2020. Uh, but so it wasn't that way before. Now, before it was bad enough. They had the divisions and the, the uh, things were done improperly, but more subtly than they are today. Here, it's, it's really over and, and truthfully many times ridiculous. What do you think it would take to get back, not, not that things were perfect when you were in the Senate, but there are some analyses I've seen which show that when you were in the Senate, the frequency with which Republicans and Democrats would work together to get certain things done was significantly higher than it is today. The, the level of division today is significantly higher. What do you think it would take to get back in the direction of the period between 69 and 81 when you when you were in the Senate to get at least some working together? Would it be a national emergency or calamity of some kind? Would it be, I mean, just what, what would it take? Well, what would it take? I don't think it can be repaired. Hmm. Uh, the, I'm coming out with a book in this summer, which is the title of it is uh, Human Governance, <clears throat> the Failure of Representative Government and a solution, which is the people. I personally believe that, that the representative government is, has failed. And I don't mean just now, uh, it goes back to the beginning of our constitution uh, where slavery was embedded forever, infinity, and, uh, and the genocide that we committed against the American Indians. So uh, no, our, our, our situation is better because of scientific advancement, not because of, of governance advancement. Uh, and so the only answer that I can think of is to empower the people to make laws. And I've spent the last 25 years working on that particular issue and, and have a constitutional amendment and a, a federal law, which would be the legislative procedures, because you can't just, people can't just make law without procedures that's anarchy. That's what we see with Brexit right now. What they need to do is to have a constitutional amendment that lays out some vital uh, aspects of this and then uh, a, a process to enact this into law. In other words, it's the people that can make the change straight away. Uh, and, and this will surprise a lot of people because uh, conventional wisdom is that uh, then you can only change the government uh, through Article 5 of the Constitution. Well, that's how the government does it. But what about the people? Uh, are the people stuck with the structure that's been, uh, that was, that's 300 years old uh, and acts that way? And, uh, and you have science, which uh, going out and making discoveries and changes and brought human society to a higher level than it's ever been. But what's holding it back is the structure of, uh, of governance, which is 300 years old and hasn't really been repaired at all. And that's what I'm hoping. So when you say, is there a chance? No, I think we're, we're stuck. We're going to continue what's been going on for the last 300 years, which is not admirable. Oh, we, 
we build it up like, you know, we're great, we're superior, we're a uh, city on a hill. No, give me a break. Uh, our, our conduct today in the world is appalling. Uh, and, and when you look at the nuclear threat that we have, it's, it's literally a suicide pact that we have uh, that's been devised uh, within the Pentagon. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we're spending $1.7 trillion. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, over cost overruns, the real money that's going to be spent is going to be around $3 trillion. So we're spending $3 trillion to refurbish our nuclear arsenal. And the purpose of that, stated by the head of the Joint Chiefs and by the Pentagon, is that we want to be able to strike terror in the hearts of our opponents so that they will know that we have the will, the will to use these nuclear devices. And of course, uh, we're, we're probably the only country in the world of the eight nukes, nuke countries, uh, we're the one that says that we're prepared to use it. Uh, as a first strike. Now, here's the kicker. The, the ability to use these uh, nuclear devices is zero. If any country were to use its nuclear capability to attack another country, don't worry about the retaliation. They're going to trigger a nuclear winter, and we're all going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's just missed in in many of the discussions about nuclear pro- proliferation, Senator. One of the things I wanted to ask you ask you about because a lot of your critiques are not just critiques of the right, but they're also critiques of the Democratic Party. What one issue would you like to see the Democratic Party in general move on? What what issue would that be? What What do you think the Democratic Party is most wrong about right now? Well, the one, the one issue that that I would be very fond of, of is uh, single payer health care. Mm. There is no, the, the, the Obamacare package <clears throat> was was really a subsidy to the insurance industry and the pharmaceutical industry, and and they've sold it. It's it's a great detail, and and so, but there's no reason why we can't have single payer health care. Uh, I I avail myself of veterans. Uh, the, the VA, and also sometimes uh, Medicare, uh, since I have both. But uh, but there's no reason why uh, the, the entire American population should have Medicare uh, and or or the equivalent of the VA, and uh, it, it costs money. But then I was just pointing out to you that we got uh, the Defense Department that is uh, uh, using up three three trillion dollars. Well, we can pay for Medicare for everybody, and we can wipe out the school debt, uh, and we can pay whatever. So the money's there. We don't have to raise taxes, and that's what the Republicans pointed out. Oh, the, the Democrats are going to raise taxes. You don't have to do that. Just just bring about some some sanity in our defense posture. Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense, was asked as he was leaving office. Uh, how much could we really cut the, the federal budget, uh, the defense budget? He said 50 percent. Well, look at if if we did away with the triad, which is uh, with the nukes, we have nukes for the Air Force. We got nukes for the Navy. We got nukes for the Army. If we did away with the Army and Air Force, we'd still have an unbelievable security with the 12 Trident submarines. Uh, that each, any one of them with 280 warheads uh, could hold the world hostage. So it, it, we're in a ridiculous situation where we're spending like fools on, on a military capability that is unwarranted. I'm not saying that we don't need some defense posture. Of course. Uh, like I say, uh, our, our, our Trident submarines could handle our defense do a fairly well. So we could cut back on a whole bunch of things, close a lot of bases around the world, uh, and begin to bring some sanity to our budgetary process. And that is to be able to take care of the health care of the people, to take care of the education of the people, and to build back our infrastructure. The, there was a recent article by the uh, concerned scientists that said that what we got to do is we got to make our opponents comfortable 
and, and uh, emotionally comfortable because if they think we're going to attack them, then they're going to react. And, and that's where you get into a situation where accidents could occur uh, in the whole nuclear area. And that's because all of our appointments uh, are, are threats, supposedly. And I say supposedly because I don't think they're real in this regard. But when you look at what's going on in the nuclear and in the cyber stage, we're talking about a new kind of warfare. But, but we, keep handle, uh, we keep manufacturing all the tools for the old kind of warfare, uh, tanks and artillery pieces. That's not the future. The future is going to be either a nuclear accident, which is going to destroy the planet, uh, or it's going to be a long-term uh, plan uh, of suicide with respect to the environment. So we have to begin to handle these questions, and they're improperly handled today. So when you ask me, is there any hope with respect to the Congress? Here, you're not even going to hear a member running for president uh, that's going to bring up the military industrial complex, except Tulsi Gabbard. And she's not getting traction because mainstream media, which is controlled by the military industrial complex, is going to try to sideline, marginalize her. Well, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, Bernie, San Bernie Sanders did speak quite a bit about the military industrial complex in his, uh, in his Fox News town hall last week. I don't know if you saw that. I, I did see that, and, and that's the first time that he's done that, hmm. that, that I noticed. And he's mentioned, and he said it very clearly, that he did not do a good job on foreign policy in his last run, and that now he's spending time getting up to speed on foreign policy. I would hope, if he gets the nomination, that he would select uh, Tulsi Gabbard as his vice president. Maybe he will. He that's been uh, that's been mentioned. That's certainly a possibility. He said he would be interested in, in having a woman. Senator Gravel, let me pause briefly. We are we've been speaking with a former U.S. Senator Mike Gravel, who is running for president. This is the end of the interview for the broadcast show. But check out the full interview on YouTube because we're going to continue talking to him uh, uh, just a little bit more.